Great. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, wonderful to see you all today. Um, before I get started, I uh, just want to make a quick note. I did upload the slides yesterday to the Slack, so you should be able to get that. Um, if you find any typos or want any clarifications in them, I'm happy to update them a little bit. So feel free to respond on that channel. Um, and and uh, at some point, I might just provide a link to them on my website or something like that where I can keep updating them. All right. Um, so this is lecture two of our series on introduction to interior point methods for discrete optimization. Um, we'll be continuing where we were last, uh, last lecture. Our goal for this week is to survey a number of the recent advances over the last decade in the use of interior point method, cover some of the foundations behind these uh, advances, and give a taste of some of the newer components that have enabled these advances as well. Last lecture, we mostly did the first part of surveying what these recent advances are. And in the last lecture, we covered a number of improvements that have happened through interior point methods for solving a range of problems like linear programming, minimum cost transshipment, bipartite matching, and, and more. Um, what we'll be doing today is kind of taking a step back from that. Um, um, now that we have a sense of what the state of the art is and have a little bit of a taste of what some of the key components enabling these advances were, what we'll be doing today is a bit more of a fundamental primer on interior point methods. Um, we'll be primarily today focused on path following methods and self concordant theory for analyzing path following interior point methods. However, as we go, I'm going to touch upon some of the modifications of this basic theory that are relevant for some of the advances I told you about last lecture. It will be relevant for some of the more advanced components I'll talk about next lecture. Um, further, as we go, I might keep going back to a few, uh, go back a little bit to talk about the implications of some of this general theory for linear programming and min cost transshipment and highlight components of the basic theory that maybe get modified for some of these advances for these problems. Um, so that's the um, ba basic plan for the lecture today. I'm going to break the lecture today into a few parts. Um, first, we'll have a brief recap with just of what these fundamental problems are that we're solving. Um, um, and we'll talk about some of the basics of interior point methods. Um, um, and then the second part of the lecture, which will be most of the lecture today, we'll go through this fundamental theory of interior point methods and, and basically see the analysis for getting a root um, number of edge iteration algorithm for solving uh, minimum cost transshipment, or this would be root n in the case of linear programs. Um, at the very end of lecture, as I have time, I might convey some of the intuition about how we can improve these iteration rate, uh, these iterate, iteration complexity that we talked about um, last lecture, and that'll segue us to us talking about a number of the advances in greater detail on Thursday morning. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, please stop me if you have questions throughout. Um, sort of the less questions I see, that maybe the faster I might end up moving through proofs. So feel free to stop me and ask me questions anytime. Um, any questions on anything before we get started? Um, also, just like last lecture, if people, um, it's uh, for those of you that feel comfortable with it, it's great seeing people's uh, faces. It helps me with pacing and seeing what I'm uh, saying makes more or less sense. However, no worries at all if you don't want to. Um, and if you also don't mind, at least when I ask some of these questions, if people wouldn't mind giving me a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down, I find that a little helpful also for the, the pacing. So everyone good with the plan before we dive into the problems we're solving in interior point methods? All right, great. All right, thank you all. All right, so um, before talking about interior point methods very broadly, just want to remind you all of the fundamental problems we're going to be talking about solving with interior point methods. So the first is linear programming, um, where we're trying to solving linear programs in this particular standard primal and dual form. Um, uh, often our pictures, even in this lecture today for discussing interior point methods, I'm typically going to draw linear programs in the dual form. Where, um, where our goal is to find the bottom of a high dimensional convex polytope. All right, so we're trying to, we have a number of, um, we're working over the region where AY is bigger than B. This is the intersection of some N different half spaces in RD. We're gonna draw this cost vector pointed straight up and our goal is going to then be to find the bottom of the intersection of these half spaces. Um, we also talked about last lecture, and this will be our recurring, probably motivating example on the combinatorial side, 
We talked about how this problem of solving a linear program in primal dual form, just in the special case where, every, where A is a matrix, where every row has exactly one one and one minus one, this problem is equivalent to solving the problem known as a minimum cost transshipment. And there's a natural bijection with, between linear programs and standard form with these sorts of constraint matrices and problems of finding the minimum cost routing of a set of demands over a graph, also known as the minimum cost transshipment problem. And we might go back to these examples as we go on. All right, so that's the problem. Everyone remember the problems before we dive into interior point methods? Great. All right, so for most of this lecture, I'm going to be talking about some of the fundamental theory that underlies interior point methods. My goal here is to provide at least one proof, uh, basic proof of how interior point methods can work and touch upon some of the modifications that will some of which we'll go into further on Thursday towards getting faster algorithms. Now, I like to joke that there are kind of two key ideas behind interior point methods. Um, they're very useful for thinking about them. Um, the first, as the name suggests, is in interior point methods, we typically work in the interior of the polytope. So the key idea is we're gonna to try to maintain feasible points or points that are strictly feasible. So points that are in the interior of the polytope you know, where AI transpose X is strictly larger than BI for, for all I. And what the way interior point methods typically work is they maintain a point that's in the interior of the polytope and strictly feasible and try to minimize the cost over time. And I like to joke the second key idea that often is shows up in some way, shape or form in interior point methods is to really stay in the interior of the polytope. So in interior point methods, typically, whether implicitly or explicitly, and we'll talk about how it happens in various different forms, there's usually some sort of barrier that's used to keep the points away from the polytope or parameterize or measure how far away a point is from the boundary of the polytope. And there's many different ways of doing it. We'll see one today, um, but typically there's some way of measuring or quantifying or trading off how much you are in the interior of the polytope, so how far away you are from uh, breaking the constraints, and how much cost you've minimized. And by different ways of having this trade-off um, lead to different sorts of methods and runtimes for interior point methods. All right, so let's be a little more concrete. Most of today, we're going to talk about one specific uh, type of interior point method known as path following methods or more, more, explicit, more, more completely, uh, there'll be short step path following methods. And again, there are many different IPM frameworks. This is just one that I think has a particularly nice uh, geometric picture and a number of very nice proofs that go with it. All right, so the way um, these methods work, I'll start by introducing them abstractly and we'll start filling in some of the details of the algorithms and the analysis as we go. So the way these methods are gonna work, we're gonna consider these path following interior point methods where we're gonna assume, just as I said on the previous slide, that we have some sort of barrier function. And for now, I'm just gonna define a barrier function as a sufficiently nice function P. Nice here, we'll, we'll, we'll quantify it a bit more as we go on, but think this is an uh, infinitely differentiable function that's convex. Um, and the key property of, of this nice function P that it will say it makes it a barrier function is it'll have the property that has finite values on every point in the interior of the polytope. And as you take any point and you bring it and you take the limit of it going towards the boundary of the polytope, the value of the function goes to infinity. All right. Any function with that property we'll call a barrier function. Now, with this barrier function, you know, there's a natural ways you can imagine we could use this barrier function to trade off how much we care about minimizing the barrier, so staying away from the constraints, and how much we want to minimize the objective, so minimize C transpose Y. And a key idea, I guess, in these path following interior point methods is, you know, what we'll try to do is use the barrier or minimizing the barrier and staying away from the constraints to kind of keep the ability for us to make progress on minimizing the cost. The idea is we're going to kind of cheerfully trade off minimizing the barrier and minimizing the cost and kind of ensure we can always make some sort of progress in moving around in the polytope. Um, the particular way we'll do this is through this penalized objective, which is just a function that's defined for any value mu, which I'll call a path parameter. Um, and, and this objective will just be mu times C transpose Y, so mu times the cost plus the penalty. So the larger mu, the more the penalized objective cares about the cost. The smaller the mu, the more the penalized objective just cares about minimizing the barrier. All right. 
Now with this, um, with any sort of a penalized objective like this and this path parameter mu, we can look at the family of minimizers of the penalized objective. So I'll denote this y sub u for each value of mu. And you can, now let's think about what these values of y sub u are. So on the one extreme, if you look at y sub zero, so you make the contribution of the cost to the penalized objective zero, all we're doing with the penalized objective, if we try to minimize it, is minimizing the barrier. So you can think of y sub zero as some sort of center of the polytope. We've ignored the cost completely, and all we're doing is minimizing some penalty for staying away from the boundary of the polytope. So minimizing um, the penalized objective for mu equals zero, or this point y sub zero, we can think of as some sort of center of a polytope. It's as far away as you can stay from all the constraints as given by the barrier function. On the other extreme, you might imagine if the barrier function is nice enough, as we take mu going to infinity, all we're doing is minimizing the cost, while the contribution to the barrier will be less and less. So you can imagine if the function's nice enough, as we take mu going to infinity, um, the, the, the value of the, mi the minimizers of this penalized objective will converge to the minimizer of uh, the linear program, all right? Now, as long as the penalized object, now as long as the boundary function is nice enough for all values of mu in between, you can think as parameterized by mu, we get some line that goes, some curve that goes from the center of the polytope towards the minimizer, a, a, a minimizer of the linear program, um, and this curve is we'll call the central path. It's called the central path of the polytope as induced by this barrier function. All right. Now, the way path following methods uh, work at a very high level is they try to follow this path from going from the center of the polytope towards a solution to the linear program. So the algorithm, um, the path following algorithm we consider is the following. We'll assume we initialize at some very large value of mu. Um, um, we'll, we'll, we'll assume for now that somehow we've managed to initialize with some value y that's close to some central path point. So some value y, we'll talk about what we mean by close eventually, but we'll start with some y that's close to one of the, um, to the central path for some value of mu. We'll call this point central, meaning it's, you know, it's, it's, it's near the central path for this value. What we'll then do is simply repeat the following until the cost of our point is small. We'll advance the path parameter. So we'll move from, we'll increase mu by a multiplicative one plus delta mu. So we're at this one point in the central path. We'll try to, we're, we're somewhere here near this one point in the central path. We'll now consider this point uh, further down the central path. And we'll try to get closer to this next point on the central path. So the way we'll question, do Aaron. Yep. Um, about, you know, why is the augment here uh, a single point and not maybe say a high dimensional subspace or something? Yep, that's a great question. And the answer in general does depend on the um, barrier function. I guess one um, of the many, we'll talk about the exact properties we'll be using of the barrier function, um, but for out, throughout um, the lecture today, to make things a little simpler, I'll always be assuming that say the barrier function is strictly convex. So it's second derivatives in every direction are strictly positive. Um, we'll also assume it's bounded. And these are all prop these are properties that all together will will ensure that the minimizer is unique. And, and this was the we will consider will always there'll be a unique minimizer. And I guess are you going to be optimizing over a, a polytope here or? Yep. So we'll be optimizing over the interior of the polytope. So this barrier function we'll think is only even defined in the interior of the polytope. Or maybe we'll think of the extended function where it has value infinity on the boundary of the polytope, um, but we'll only be working with those such such points. Yeah, I just meant we're working with a polytope rather than a polyhedron. Is that something you're asking me? Um, like a bounded. Yeah, and we'll be assuming that the region's bounded probably throughout and th things like that. Yeah, we'll always be assuming that it's bounded. I, I guess more broadly, we might work with the case where instead of it being a polytope, it's some arbitrary convex set, but it'll always be convex and we'll assume it's bounded. Um, so so the, the, these are good questions and there's maybe additional technical conditions uh, you need to check. In general, throughout, these, throughout uh, the lecture today, though you can do this more carefully, I'm probably going to be um, a little informal with exactly like boundary conditions and where exactly you need boundedness and, and uniqueness and things like that. But please feel free to ask the questions throughout. Um, I can point to where they're done more formally than these, these notes.
Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So we're at our current central path point. We want to move to this next central path point. And the way we'll do that, and, and maybe the simplest versions of path following schemes is through Newton's method. So in other words, we have our current point. We'll, we have our new penalized objective we want to optimize. So we can compute our next central path point. We'll compute the second order Taylor approximation to the function and we'll minimize it. And the result of that is simply to let our next point be the result of applying the inverse of the Hessian at our current, uh, this should be mu plus delta. Oh no, we already updated mu here, sorry. The Hessian at our current point inverse applied to the gradient of the point. So we compute the gradient at the point, we compute the Hessian inverse, and uh, moving in minus that direction will be the result of the step. Um, in general, you can imagine doing this a few times. However, in the schemes we'll consider, we'll, we'll typically always show it suffices just to take one such step, All right? And that'll be the whole method. So we advance, we're at our current path point, we increase the parameter, we take a Newton step to get close to the next point, we increase the path parameter, we take a Newton step to get close to the next point, and we repeat. And we'll show in the settings we consider that this amount of multiplicative increase you can do in every iteration will correspond roughly to the number of iterations we need in the interior point method. And the settings we'll consider, that'll be the setup. So the can more I ask we a question? Can, um, one, sure, one, one sec. Um, the, the more we can advance the path parameter, um, the more progress we'll be able to make. Um, and I'm happy to take questions on this just to, to wrap up the slide. You can, you can think this method is some discretization here of the central path we're following. We're kind of using Newton steps and uh, to kind of discretize somehow following the central path. And, and the upshot to take from this right away in keeping with the theme of everything I talked about last, um, last lecture is you can think that provided we can come up with a barrier and we can get this initial point on the central path, and this is fair that this is how much we need to increase the path parameter, this whole scheme reduces the question of solving the linear program to simply being able to compute gradients and Hessians of our barrier and solving a single linear system in every iteration. And in many, many but not all of the cases that we might consider, um, the barrier in this is the, the most computationally expensive part of each of these steps is solving this linear system. And this is how generically path following you can essentially think is now a reduction from linear programming, or we'll talk about a more broadly convex programming, to solving a sequence of linear systems. Though, though I should point out their settings were actually, um, they're actually settings where computing the barrier like itself can be more expensive than solving a linear system. Um, like the universal barrier case I talked about last class. But yes, please, questions. So, so in that step where you do the Newton step, if you did something like the first order method step, like a gradient descent step, yeah. what would go wrong? Like the number of iterations would be high or? Um, that's a great question. In about uh, a few transitions, I'm gonna talk about how that would work as well. Um, I would also, um, this, this is maybe not the most uh, prevalent way to discuss Newton's method, but, but one way I even think about Newton's method is you can think of it as one step of gradient descent in the norm induced by the Hessian where the step size is one. Or it's sort of like you're pretending like your function is a quadratic and perfectly conditioned and you're just like taking one, the, 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 one, the one gradient step. Um, but I should also point out if you, if you change your step size to make that gradient descent story I said even truer, um, everything, a lot of the analysis will work just fine depending on the exact assumptions you make on your, 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 um, your barrier function. However, in many of the settings here, if you replace the Hessian with any multiplicative approximation, as long as you're willing to not just take one step, but maybe take a few steps, the analysis otherwise goes unchanged up to a constant. I, I shouldn't say unstable, like, you know, you took a few more steps, you maybe whatever properties you have to use, you modify a little bit, but mo most the interior point schemes I can think of, at least in this framework, are robust under those sorts of changes. And that's a great question. I was actually going to comment on it explicitly in a few slide transitions. Yeah. Um, I guess one is, one more question. So just just to confirm, your delta mu depends on mu, right? So what do you mean by saying roughly delta mu inverse iteration suffice? Ah, uh, so so here delta mu is a fixed constant. I'm using it to distinguish in case we want to bring up a different delta later and have like talk about a delta some something else. But this delta mu is just a fixed 
value that's only going to depend on the value of the barrier. So for instance, when we try to solve, you know. So if I, if I want an epsilon or one plus epsilon approximation to the optimum, your delta will depend on that epsilon? No, so, uh, that's a great question. So, so, so think this delta mu, um, and we could have just written as delta, is going to be a fixed amount that's actually going to depend only on the barrier. So we're going to talk about what properties we need of the barrier for it to be sufficient for us to be allowed to pick a certain value of delta. Um, think for in the most basic case of like a simple barrier for linear programming, what corresponds to perhaps these like m to the three halves min cost flow algorithms we talked about yesterday. Delta is going to be set at like uh, one over root m up to a constant. Okay. Now, now, now this the statement is when we do this every time now we take root m steps, mu is going to double. And we'll show that essentially um, up to um, like a kind of a constant that maybe depends on dimension, like you know a value of m, let's say, um, doubling mu will correspond to having the function error. So now if we want to get epsilon accuracy, we'll just need to double it log one over epsilon times or log whatever this constant is over epsilon times. So I'm using this tilde here to hide log. So it's gonna hide that log factor in epsilon that you raised. So, so, and if when we pick delta to be one over root m, this is just going to be a root m iteration algorithm up to log factors like logs in the log in the desired accuracy. Does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Uh, great, great, great questions. Um, and again, my answers here are a little informal. I can point to where there's more formal things. And and just in the discussion of Newton's method, the step size one, the story gets a little funnier with gradient descent. But um, you could, for instance, do damped Newton steps here, and, and things would also possibly work. And then it looks more like gradient descent. All right. Great questions. So this is the basic scheme. Any other questions before uh, we, 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 we go on? The basic method template clear? Okay. Um, and as we've already started discussing, there are many possible modifications you could use of the scheme, and different of these modifications can be helpful in different in different contexts. Um, one uh, modification I should point out immediately is a thing that's often done in variants of this in practice, um, is you could imagine that rather than simply increasing mu by a fixed amount and then trying to center to the point, and then increasing mu by a fixed amount, you can imagine there's a bunch of ways we could try to be smarter and at our current point mu predict how the central path is going to change. So you can ima imagine what we do is at this current point why we you know center really well and try to look at how the central path is locally changing and try to move to predict where the next central path point will be. You can even imagine different schemes where we try to you know better approximate the curve or see how it's going to change over a few steps and use this to better get close to the central path. You might even take such steps and not end up really close to the central path, but hope that a few steps like this, you'll eventually get close enough to the central path. And there's a number of different ways that you could maybe try to take longer steps, so big to bigger and ultimately be increasing you at a faster rate in different ways of measuring how close you are to the central path. Um, for the lectures today, we'll always consider schemes where we'll be maintaining a point that's always close enough to the central path that every time we take one of these centering steps, we make like a constant multiplicative progress in some notion of distance to the path. So essentially always maintain the property that we're close enough to the path that we can essentially get a high precision estimate of the central path point by just taking a few more steps. And at least in all the schemes today, that's the, the settings we'll be considering. And we'll call such points that are close enough that you could, in principle, get very close to the central path as central points. And we'll only be considering those today. However, we might talk about a bit more on Thursday, um, different ways of parameterizing how close uh, you are to the central path uh, or a central path can, can be very helpful for getting faster methods. Um, another natural modification um, you might consider is you don't have to actually take Newton steps here, but there's a variety of approximations you could handle. So for instance, you can show that if you replace the Hessian here with any spectral approximation to it M, if you're willing to possibly just take a few more steps here, you can also show, at least in the schemes we'll consider today, that that method will work as well. And once you make this sort of a modification and change the step size, 
So put in a, a step size eta here. You can think of these as instead taking a few steps in of gradient descent, sort of in the norm induced by the Hessian. And so that way you can think what these methods are doing is they're taking a current point in the central path. They're looking at the Hessian and the norm that that induces, taking a few steps of an iterative method in that norm to get the next point and repeating. Mm -hmm. There was your, uh, your question earlier. All right. Um, I should also note that while most of our pictures are gonna be focused on the dual, there's also a natural primal version of this scheme you could consider as well. So you can imagine trying to solve the primal problem where we're maximizing over non-negative x that obey this linear constraint of a transpose x equals c, b transpose x. Similarly, you could define um, a penalized objective here where we have a, um, a barrier function for the inequalities x larger than zero and work with repeatedly minimizing this penalized objective subject to just now the linear constraint over points that are not negative where we have a barrier function to keep us away from the boundary. Um, and you can imagine we run the same scheme where we initialize with a central path, path point. We repeatedly increase the path parameter until the cost is large. And just where this method might differ, yes, this is someone asked, yes, this should be an arg max. Um, we'd um, good, good question. Um, um, and just where this scheme would differ is how the central steps actually are. So here we would keep the linear constraints explicitly in every step. And rather than here, we designed a Newton step by taking the second order Taylor approximation to the objective and minimizing it. Here, we would take the, again, the second order Taylor approximation to the objective. Um, these should all be Gs. But we would maximize it subject to the linear constraint. And if you work out what the resulting step is, it looks very much like a Newton step. So you let your next point be the result of the Hessian inverse times the gradient. However, you need to project this into the, um, a direction where A transpose X is actually equal to C. And so where the step differs is through this projection matrix, which is I minus you know, the Hessian inverse applied to A, a linear system involving A. So A transpose Hessian inverse A inverse times A transpose. Um, this is not an orthogonal projection matrix, but you can check this as a matrix where um, Everything um, in the image of this is in the kernel of A transpose. So you can check that this uh, step will preserve the property that A transpose X equals C if you start from some X where AX, A transpose X equals C, All right? And again, you can we'll, for this show that roughly the same number of iterations suffice. Okay. Any Just questions? to confirm that there is no correspondence between directly what's happening in the dual and the primal right the, these are just you're just telling us how to what would be the framework if you have equality constraints that's that's exactly right yeah so so as i've described it there's not necessarily a correspondence these i haven't said anything about you're exactly right how this dual penalty and this primal penalty connect however i'll actually talk about it a little later for some of the barriers we'll consider actually most of them there is a natural correspondence between primal and dual barriers and in some of the schemes we might start talking about more on Thursday, um, it's actually helpful to maintain primal and dual points. Um, but um, but for, for now, this is just describing what the analogous steps look like. And um, the reason I'm doing that, that's a great leading question, is though I think a lot of the geometry and pictures are nicer in the dual, and I'll often be working with the dual method for giving some of the geometry of the methods. Um, I think when thinking about sort of algorithmically how what the methods look like, I, I personally find it very helpful to picture and look at what the methods are in the dual. Where in the, this was um, for things like minimum cost transshipment, the dual steps correspond to actually updating your flow rather than some sort of dual potential like information. Sorry, so the information primal? I think is nicer. Oh, for the primal, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, the primal corresponds to flow, right? And as thank you for the, the leading question, well, we'll discuss primal dual methods a bit later. Well, but they, they don't satisfy any complementary slackness or anything, right? Y and X, the way you're moving. I, 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 you know, uh, I mean, for some of the barriers we'll consider later, there is a natural duality and there's ways you could naturally try to derive a dual barrier from a primal barrier. But at this point, I haven't really said anything about really what properties there are of the barrier. So in the, in the full abstract setting, a um, okay. little hesitant to say exactly, exactly what happened, but we'll see in certain cases. Does that make sense? Mm 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just quickly, is there any, like, is the running time for the primal and the dual method, are they going to sort of correspond or can be one be quicker than the other? Um, you know, it, it kind of depends on the setting and what, and what uh, tricks you run. I guess there are some settings, like, for instance, max flow, where it's, it's convenient to work in the dual. However, I'm always very hesitant to say that a method is only a bit hesitant to kind of formally try to talk about a method being primal or dual. Like the moment you'd have gradients and use that or get some sort of local optimality, there is a primal dual mapping often sitting around. So I'm a little hesitant to try to formally say whether there is not a dual method or not for, for something. Um, and, and in many of the cases, you can get primal or dual. And there's some cases where it's been more convenient to work only with the primal. So for instance, some of the, some of the cases I've, I mentioned last class of two-sided barriers. And I talked about um, how there's additional modifications you need for handling two-sided constraints. Um, some of those methods, the analysis typically kind of stays in the primal. Though it keeps around some approximability information, which you can maybe talk about as a, as a dual. So I maybe think about such methods more primal, um, but, but a little hesitant to kind of formally say it's not dual or you can't do a dual method to it if it's not a standard type. That's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so a few more. Um, all right, so with all this in mind, there's maybe some natural questions you might be run, asking about how to run this scheme. Um, the first question you might ask is, this, this scheme all makes sense. Um, that sounds great if you're on the central path, you can, you can move down it very quickly. Um, however, you might be asking, how do you actually get this initial point that's close to the central path? Um, and in some cases, there's sort of an explicit transformation you can do to argue you get a central point. A point. Um, however, there's also a nice sort of generic scheme you can use to get this initial point if you're somehow given a point in the interior, strictly in the interior of the polytope. Um, and the scheme works as follows. And the idea behind it is if we're given some point in the interior of the polytope, one way you can get um, a point on the central path is what you could do is try to compute the center. So you have your point in the interior of the polytope but you want to be on the central path to run this scheme, what you could do is essentially try to run the method somehow in reverse or run some sort of reverse method to move towards the center of the polytope. All right. And the way the scheme looks is essentially very analogous to the algorithm we said before, just run in reverse. So if you're given any point in the interior of the polytope, if you pick mu equal one and just change the cost vector to be minus the gradient, you know, the optimality conditions, you know, if we're in this case where P is convex, is that the gradient of this is zero. And when mu is one, the gradient of this is just C plus the gradient of P. So if we just set P, C to B minus the gradient, this point will be exactly central for that, va that value of C, whatever this initial point is in the interior. What you could do at that point is simply repeat until somehow the contribution of mu um, uh, to, to this is small, you could simply keep decreasing the path parameter, taking the same central steps until you're close enough to the center that the contribution of the cost is so little that if we switch the cost to the true cost, we're now on the central path for the original central path. So you could just you know, take your point, run the scheme in reverse until you're close to the central, switch cost, and then go to the bottom. And We'll show actually that you know the way we'll analyze the methods, they actually won't really make too much of a distinguish, like care too much about whether you're increasing the path parameter or decreasing the path parameter. So of the, the complexity of taking steps in each direction will be roughly the same in the analysis we'll, we'll see today. And I think this is kind of interesting. The upshot of this, I think it says like, once you have a good barrier and you have the ability to compute this barrier and solve linear systems, for the sorts of barriers we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, you can essentially think they're giving a way to efficiently move around the polytope by solving these linear systems. But there's essentially these different pathways from your point to the center and to some sort of limit. 
and the barrier is giving you efficient ways to sort of move along these paths throughout the polytope. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see eventually, since we're solving linear systems, how well these methods work. We'll have, we'll have to do with how well, how fast the Hessian of the function changes along the path. The regions in which we'll take steps will have to do with the norm induced by those Hessians. And ultimately, this will be a statement about sort of decomposing uh, arbitrary polytope or convex set into a sequence of ellipses that don't change too much. And that'll be a recurring theme we'll see through the analysis in the rest of the day. All right, any questions on this? Scheme clear? All right. Uh, so, Another... so, so, sorry, uh, one question, maybe the yeah. second green line on the previous slide. Um, <laughs> this mu times C plus uh, the gradient um, uh, was not clear if C is minus gradient, we kind of have zero. Yeah. yeah, I guess I, if I did this right, though I should double check, you can correct me if there's a typo later. I should, I meant to bring this up so that this corresponds to kind of your, the, um, the, the, the change you're getting in the gradient when you switch eventually for your value of mu from the, 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 this C that you picked to the original C. That's, that's where this is coming from. Okay. Um, you can you. check me later if I wrote the wrong formula. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's what it's meant to be. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, another question you might ask is how do you actually contain a point in the interior of the polytope to start? Um, again, um, and note also to even run the scheme, it could be the case that the interior of the polytope is just empty. So, you know, to, you know there might not be an interior of the polytope to start. Um, however, for a variety of the problems you might consider, and again, this depends a bit on the structure, often there's a way to transform the problem you want to solve so that you can reduce um, solving the problem or checking feasibility or getting an approximately feasible point to the problem of minimizing the objective of a related problem um, where you're given an explicit point in the interior. Um, there's a number of different ways you can do this. Some are perhaps nicer or cleaner than others and depends on the setting. Just to give you a quick taste of how this might look, um, suppose we wanted to solve an arbitrary linear program but we don't know if the interior is feasible. What we can imagine doing is just adding a new variable alpha. And instead of minimizing over the set where ay is at least b, we can minimize over the set where ay plus alpha times the all ones vector is at least b. And what we could do is minimize the cost of c plus some big penalty on this term alpha. So r time plus alpha for some very, very large value of r. Now, note that for any y and large enough alpha, Clearly, a y plus alpha is in the interior because you know eventually we'll pick alpha large enough that this will be uh, stricter in inequality. And if we pick r to be sufficiently large, if you can, if you will be able to show that if there is a feasible point of low cost, you know, then for very very large value of r, when we minimize this well enough, we'll have very very little contribution on alpha, and we'll have something that's approximately feasible. Now, how to actually do that transformation at the end depends a bit more on the geometry of the original problem, but, but that should give you a quick taste of how you can turn getting a minimizing cost of this objective sufficiently well to getting an approximately feasible point for the original polytope provided there was one of near optimal cost. Similarly, if you wanted to solve a more combinatorial problem, like we we're trying to solve minimum cost transshipment, um, and we wanted to you know, now minimize the cost subject to a non-negative flow that routes the demands. Um, simply finding a feasible point for this, this uh, region, finding an F that routes the demands that's not negative. Um, so fun exercise, you can check this problem is actually as hard as checking whether or not a graph has a perfect matching. So just checking feasibility of this region is, is already non-trivial. Um, however, there's a natural way, again, we can modify the problem. We have this graph that we want to route over. This is how I draw large complex graphs. Um, we, we have all these constraints and demands we want to route. What you can imagine doing is just adding a new vertex and adding edges to and from this vertex, from every vertex in the original graph. And now imagine you just put some flow on every single edge. And then for the demands that if you, the degree you haven't routed the demands, you just add associated flows to the star. 
All right. This will give you something that's feasible. You can compute it very quickly. And as long as what we then do is make the cost of putting any flow on these star edges sufficiently high, if there was a way to route the demands of low cost in the original graph, when we then minimize this new transportation problem of minimizing where these high costs here, these associated demands, will have very, very little flow on the star edges. All right. All right. So that's it for basic interior point setup. In the rest of class now, we're going to start lecture today. We'll start um, being a little more formal and analyzing you know, these interior point methods and talking about what properties we need the barrier. All right, any questions? All right, hopefully it should give you a sense that now our goal is just to figure out what properties we need of the barrier so that we can quickly follow the central path. At least if we wanna get some sort of provable rates for solving these problems. Okay. So the way, the, pro the key, prop uh, key property we're going to use or assume of our barrier function to do our analysis is something known as self-concordance. Um, this is a very natural assumption on functions that arises um, when analyzing Newton's method. Um, as discussed in this uh, wonderful, uh, very influential book of Nesterov and Nemirovsky in the 90s. Um, and you can think self-concordance is a certain just natural affine invariant property. So a property of the function that's preserved under affine transformations that essentially says that you can bound the multiplicative change in the Hessian of these functions if you don't move too much in the Hessian norm. All right, and I'll talk a bit more about this property. We'll see a number of geometric implications of this sort of property as we go. Um, I should point out uh, straight up that uh, right away that uh, a lot of my analysis and presentation here is uh, very highly influenced um, and some of the proofs are very similar or, or the same as some of the proofs in um, these wonderful lecture notes of uh, um, uh, Yuri Nesterov that I highly recommend. All right, so let me be a little more formal. Let's do one dimension first. In one dimension, we'll say that a function is a self-concordant function. If it has the property that it's third derivatives at any point, or at most the second or twice times the second derivatives at the point raised to the three halves. Now, um, throughout these notes, as I've mentioned, I'll be assuming away some boundary cases. I'll always be assuming that F is strictly convex, infinitely differentiable. I'll assume that the second derivatives are always positive. Um, so things like the second derivatives are always invertible. So we'll make some of the analysis a little simpler. Though, though things do generalize with, with additional assumptions. All right. So in one dimension, that's all that this assumption says. We can bound the third derivatives. So we can bound how much the second derivatives change um, relative to something about the second derivatives. In higher dimensions, we'll say a function is self-concordant. Um, I should point out this is actually the, the definition of one self-concordance, but I'll be omitting the one throughout. And just if you were alpha self-concordance, you'd put a different value alpha in here. Um, and in higher dimensions, we'll say a function is self-concordant if its restriction to any line is self-concordant. Meaning if we take any point x in the domain in any direction h, and we look at the function g of alpha, that's f of x plus alpha h, this is a one self-concordant function. So we take our function, we take a, we take our function, we take our point, we restrict to this line, and we look at just at how the function changes along this line, that should be a one self-concordant function. Now, if you map what this is saying in terms of its third derivatives, this is the same as saying that if we look at the third uh, directional derivatives in some HH direction, that's bounded in magnitude by the directional derivative in the H, uh, H direction, um, raised to the three halves. Um, and a little bit of notation I'm going to be using, um, I'll probably try to avoid using to this directional derivative notation often in the notes. Um, so this, um, I'm going to be using this notation, uh, so this is the directional derivative in this h, h direction. This is the same as just h transpose the Hessian of f of x times h, which I'm going to write more compactly as um, uh, h in the Hessian norm. So for any matrix A, I'm going to use this notation that a vector x in the A norm is just square root x transpose AX. Okay. There's a few other versions of this we might use. 
So you can show that this is actually equivalent to assuming that if we look at the direction, the derivative, whether it's in the H1 direction, the H2, H3 direction, we look at these third derivatives, this is bounded by twice the product of each of these HI in the Hessian norm. And one more, this is the one that we'll actually probably use the most in the analysis. Um, and this is maybe the one I think about a bit more often. Um, you can think of function equivalent, you can say a function self-concordance if the following happens. If you take a point X and you look at moving the point X in the dth direction, in direction D, and if you look at the change of the Hessian in this direction D, that this change in the Hessian, the derivative of the Hessian, you can show that it's upper bounded by the Hessian times the magnitude of this change in the D direction in the Hessian norm, and similarly lower bounded by minus that. So you can think this is saying the change in the Hessian is sort of bounded relative to the Hessian up to the magnitude of the direction you're moving in the Hessian norm. Where I'm using, I'm going to use this notation throughout that A is at most B spectrally if H transpose A, H, A, H is at most H transpose B, H for all H. Okay. All right. Um, and again, this, this property actually is just a specialization of this property where we picked H2, each of those H3. Okay. Um, now, there's a number of nice properties of self-concordant functions. We will not talk about them all today. We'll just touch upon a few. There's many, many nice properties they have. Um, one is that it's F on invariant. So if F is self-concordant, then F of AX plus B is also a self-concordant function. You can also show that it's closed under summation. So if F and G are self-concordant, then their sum is self-concordant. And to start making things a little more concrete, you can show that for things like um, the orthant, so the set of non-negative vectors, the barrier that's simply defined for all x is the sum of minus log of that coordinate, or you know, this is the sum of log of one over that coordinate. You can show that that is a self-concordant function. Um, and it's a barrier for the orthant, because as any coordinate goes to zero, log of one over that coordinate will go to infinity. All right. To see that's a self-concordant function, you can just look at the derivatives and you'll see that the third derivatives are exactly minus two times the second derivatives to the three halves. Okay. All right, so that's the definition. Um, um, and um, this is a particular barrier we'll use. Um, I think it can be helpful as we go through this before talking about some of the implications of self-concordance and how you analyze, you know, interior point methods for self-concordant functions. I think it can be, um, I, I think it's both very important to know the self-concordant theory and know the general properties of self-concordant functions. I think it's very helpful for when you do interior point analysis or do something more tailored for a combinatorial problem. I think it's very helpful to know when you're using something about the, very, the general self-concordant theory or you've used something sort of tailored to more special to your particular problem in the analysis you're doing. Um, but I think it can also be helpful to see what the methods look like and what everything looks like in some of these specific special cases. So before talking about, um, so before sort of doing the anal analysis of interior point methods was under self-concordance, I just wanna show what the interior point methods we're describing look like under the logarithmic barrier function. Um, the logarithmic barrier function is perhaps one of the most common used for linear programming. Um, it's what led to a um, uh, number of fast algorithms in different settings up to some of the advances in the last few years. So I just want to go through what, what some of the methods look like when we use the logarithmic barrier. So let's go back to our example of solving a dual linear program. Um, so this linear pro um, if we're trying to solve this linear program, uh, just a little notation, I'm gonna let S sub Y denote the slack variables associated with variable Y. So this is simply the difference of AY minus B. For any vector Y in the interior of the polytope, the slacks are a, a, a positive uh, vector. Um, the point Y is in the polytope if and only if its slacks are not negative. Um, and I'm gonna use uh, S sub mu to denote the slacks at the central path point for value of mu. Um, also, I'm going to use, let S sub Y in bold, you denote the slack matrix, which is just the diagonal matrix with the slacks on the boundary. Now, um, a natural barrier to use for the set of AY larger than B 
is simply the log barrier applied to the slacks. So sum over all the constraints um, minus log of the slack of that variable. This is just you know the same for each of these is a log of a AI transpose Y minus BI. Okay. This is just an affine transformation of the logarithmic barrier. And since we said the logarithmic barrier is self-concordant and affine transformations preserve self-concordance, this is self-concordant. All right. Now, if you look at the gradient and the Hessian of this barrier, the gradient uh, of the penalized objective with this barrier, the gradient is just mu times the cost. And you can check that the gradient of the barrier is A transpose times this diagonal slack to matrix inverse times the L1's vector. In other words, you take the, the constraint matrix A, you rescale every row by one over the distance to that constraint, and then apply the L1's vector to it. So you aggregate together all these different reweighted distances to the constraints. And the Hessian matrix for that is just A transpose um, the slack the matrix minus 2A, which you can just think is A transpose A, where again, we've done this transformation of rescaling every row by one over the distance to the constraint. All right. Now, if you look at a centering step for the log barrier, um, you know, all we're doing is solving um, a linear system in A transpose SY, um, the slack matrix to the minus two times A. And this gives um, the sort of iteration complexities I talked about yesterday. Okay. All right, you could ask uh, what happens in the dual. Um, again, there you could pick the logarithmic barrier function as the barrier. The gradient and the Hesse, the gradient of uh, this barrier is just um, x um, inverse times all ones vector, or this is like the vector where this is the the vector where every entry is x i inverse. Or we use a capital X just to know the diagonal, the matrix of the x on the diagonal, and the Hessian is just minus x to the uh, minus two. Now, if you look at what a centering step is, um, again, uh, here, Hessian inverse times the gradient, this is something we can compute very easily. All we're doing is taking a linear cost and doing like diagonal scalings of a vector. Um, where the linear system arises in this step is in computing this projection, where again, we solve a linear system in A under just some diagonal rescaling of A. Okay. Um, and as exactly as we talked about earlier, interestingly, you can actually show that these two functions are dual to each other, uh, at least up to some additive cost that depends only on mu. Right? And you can, um, and they're actually connected by the mapping that if for a, a value of mu, if we look at the central path point, um, if we look at the central path point for um, the, the primal for a value of mu, and we look at that value of x, and we look at the slacks for that value of mu, you can show that their product is related as just one over mu. So there's a natural mapping between uh, this primal dual mapping between slacks and the dual and values in the primal. All right. And towards your question, so in this particular case, the log barrier is, is dual. You know, these, these two objective functions are dual to each other up to an additive constant, it just depends on mu. Um, you can also show that uh, if you took a primal, the point on the primal central path and the dual central path, and you looked at the duality gap of these two points as measured by um, the duality gap on the underlying linear program. So you looked at the cost of the dual minus the cost of the primal. You can show that that gap is exactly M over mu. So in other words, this proves that if you have a mu central primal or dual central path point, it's error, like how high, much higher its cost is than the optimal cost is just M over mu. And this is towards what I was talking about when I mentioned that doubling mu corresponds to having your function error. This says as you increase mu by alpha, at least under this measure, your function error decreases by M over alpha. Okay. Um, and we'll talk maybe a bit more about this primal dual setup on, on uh, we'll talk a bit more about this primal dual setup on uh, Thursday. Um, I think this primal dual and this, this view of the um, optimality conditions of the primal dual can be helpful for robust methods. And we'll actually show later this property holds more generally um, of bounding the duality gap. Um, what about for combinatorial problems? Suppose we want to then apply this primal method to minimum cost transshipment. 
Um, if you look at what this projection matrix we um, take steps with, um, if you expand it out, this projection matrix is just I minus the current value of the flow squared times A, A transpose this primal value of the flow squared A inverse, A transpose. Okay. Now you may, now this, this step actually has a very nice interpretation in terms of certain combinatorial problems. So suppose we're now in this setup where we're trying to solve min-cost transshipment. We have some graph. And suppose we did the following. Suppose we had our demands we wanted to route, some demands we wanted to route. So we want to get some flow that has imbalances given by these demands. And suppose we had some positive values, I'll call resistances for the edges. Turns out, if you try to compute the flow of minimum, uh, this is known as energy, which is the sum over all the edges, the flow on the edge squared times the resistance, subject to routing the demands. If you try to compute this flow, it's known as an electric flow, routing D, demand D with resistances R. You can show that this electric flow is exactly um, uh, sort of of this form. It's R inverse A, A transpose R inverse A inverse times D, where R is some diagonal matrix. So from this, if you actually look at what this projection matrix is doing when you apply it to what, so what this implies is if you look at this matrix here, applied to some vector D, what this is doing is computing the minimum energy flow. So it's computing a flow that routes these demands D that minimizes energy on a graph where the resistances are given by the flow. So this operator is computing a minimum energy flow where you're penalizing um, using edges that have a very small amount of flow on them. So the smaller the flow, the higher the resistance. So computing this projection matrix, this here, um, if we apply this to some vector V, since A transpose applied to a vector is just getting the demands routed by this vector, applying this um, projection matrix P to a vector is the same as taking that vector and subtracting off the electric flow routing the demands corresponding to that vector on the graph where the resistance of every edge is one over the low squared. So this has a nice interpretation on graphs. As we talked about last time, in the case of graphs, this can be solved in nearly linear time. Okay, that's to give a sense. Um, let's go back to our analysis of interior point question methods. Any questions on anything I've covered so far? Okay. All right. So why study self-concordant functions? Um, so um, why, why is this useful for the analysis of interior point methods? Um, so I'll give one property. First, I'll give this one property towards understanding um, self-concordant functions. And this, this property kind of corresponds to what I was saying was the intuition behind uh, self-concordance. So this property is a certain formal way of saying that the Hessian of a self-concordant function is stable if you move a point by not too much in the norm induced by the Hessian. So formally, this lemma says if we have any two points in the domain of a self-concordant function, and if we let R denote the distance between the two points in the norm induced by its Hessian, if that distance is at most one, then if we look at the Hessian of Y, we can upper and lower bound it by the Hessian of X, F, uh, Hessian of F at X spectrally in terms of something that just depends on R, how far away the points are. So what this says is in a region where you don't move your point by more than a constant in the Hessian norm, the Hessian itself doesn't change by more than a constant, spectrally. So the Hessian's well approximated everywhere multiplicatively. Right. Um, a corollary of this says that if F is a barrier for its domain and you have any point X in the domain and you take any point Y where you know, the difference between X and Y and the Hessian norm is at most one, then that point must be in the domain also. Like that point must be in the interior. So if say F is a barrier for a polytope, this says that every point that's within distance one of the original point in the Hessian norm is in the polytope also. And I'm being a little informal with some of the continuity reason, reasoning here, but essentially the proof of this is that if you take your point and you bring it towards the boundary of the polytope, the value of the function has to go to infinity 
So the gradient has to blow up and therefore the Hessian has to blow up also, but this says that the Hessian doesn't blow up. Is that less than or equal to one meant to be strictly less than one? I mean, just to take it. Yeah, so, so I'm, again, this is exactly not being careful with the boundary of the polytope. So I don't know, I, I guess if we're, I may be thinking of the function over the extended reals where the boundary is in the domain, it just has value infinity and then it's completely contained within. Otherwise you'd have to do strict equalities, but I'm, I'm being a little informal with that bit. All right, um, this has actually, I think a very nice picture geometrically. This says that if we look at um, uh, nice intuition geometrically, so, so I'm gonna define the decan ellipse of radius one um, at a point X, just to be the set of point Y's where the distance from X and the Hessian norm is at most R, okay? So the Hessian is, um, uh, we're working with convex functions. The Hessian is positive semi-definite. So this region here just is some ellipse, um, some ellipse induced by the Hessian. And what this corollary says in terms of a picture is it says that the, um, um, this, this first lemma essentially says that the Hessian is stable in the Deacon ellipse of radius one. So like the Deacon ellipse doesn't change too much multiplicatively in any direction when you move within the Deacon ellipse of radius strictly less than one. And the second corollary geometrically is just saying if you take any point and you draw the Deacon ellipse of radius one, it's inside the polytope, where it's inside the, the domain up to this boundary issue that we just discussed. So if I wrote strictly less than one, then it'd be contained in the interior. Okay. Well, it's a nice geometric statement. Um, one of the nice things about working with these barrier functions is that we you know, don't have to, we we're kind of can work with unconstrained optimization other than these sort of affine constraints. And this is showing, giving a nice bound of a region we can work with in an unconstrained sense where we're guaranteed to stay in the domain um, and therefore it's valid to sort of work with just unconstrained rather than constrained optimization. Okay. And it starts to also show how under nice assumptions of the function, um, self-concordance gives us a way of um, mapping geometric statements of the, um, it starts giving a way of like reasoning about the domain in terms of ellipses induced by the function. Okay, now um, uh, I really appreciate all the questions. I guess I've been getting a number of great ones. This discussion has been great. In the interest of time, I think though, um, as a result of this, I might not go through the proofs in great detail. I will be releasing the slides. So maybe I'll just say like a word of intuition under some of the proofs and you can go through the algebraic der derivations on your own. Um, so the proof of this fact is as follows. Um, the proof works like a number of the proofs, all, many of the proofs in the, these, note, the, these slides all work in a similar way. That's how a lot of convex optimization proofs work. We want to know something about um, point Y given something about point X. We have all these nice bounds on the derivative of the function. We know things about self-concordance along lines. So what we'll do is we'll look at a line um, from X to Y. So what we'll do is I'll let, usually in these proofs, I'll let xt denote x plus t times y minus x. And essentially what we'll do is integrate or take derivatives over the line to try to prove whatever claim we want. So for letting xt be this, um, that's exactly how this proof works. We'll look at the derivative of the quadratic form of h with respect to the Hessian along the line. We'll use self-concordance to bound the derivative. Um, once we have self-concordance giving this sort of bound, first we could try to bound how much y and x move in the Hessian norm. We'll take the right function, use a derivative to get that it's bounded. To get how much the difference of y minus x in the Hessian norm changes over the line, we'll then integrate this nice bound on the derivative we've proven. Um, this gives us a bound on how far much y minus x in the Hessian norm changes as we move the Hessian along the line. And then once we have that to compute how much the entire quadratic form changes, we can compute a derivative and integrate and use the bound of the derivative we computed. And that's, that's the proof. So it's a bunch of algebra, but it's the, this repeated formula of look along the line, compute a derivative along the line. And once you see the, the formula for the derivative to compute how much things have changed, integrate that derivative bound. And this proof just applies that technique twice. Okay. All right, so that's the proof. Um, I should note that some of these proofs in the particular case of working with the things like the log barrier actually have much more succinct proofs 
In some cases, they're even stronger. So if we wanted to prove the analogy of the, this, the same statement for let's say the log barrier applied to the dual. So say we're looking at the dual linear program, we want to show that the Hessian doesn't change too much when we move a, a point in the Hessian norm, okay? So let's just maybe look at this proof specialized. We want to bound, um, we want to bound something about um, what happens when we move from a point X to a point Y in the Hessian norm. So, so, so in this notation, R squared denotes the difference but distance between X and Y in the Hessian norm squared. The Hessian is just A transpose slack to the minus two A here. Um, just algebraic manipulation, we can move A inside the norm here. And what's nice about this is what is AX minus AY? AX minus AY is actually just the same as the slack of X minus the slack of Y because the linear term in B cancels. So the distance between any two points and the norm induced by the Hessian for the dual is actually the same as asking for the distant difference between the slacks in just this diagonal norm induced by the slacks raised to the minus two. So this difference is actually just the sum over all the constraints of the distance difference between the slacks divided by one of the slacks squared. So again, the distance between two points in the Hessian norm for the log barrier is actually just looking at sort of the L2 norm of the multiplicative difference in the slacks. Now, if you wanna show the Hessian changes too much, it suffices just to show that none of the slacks change too much. And if this is bounded by R, this implies that every one of these terms is this is bounded by R squared, then plus that every one of these terms is bounded by R. And just that bound actually proves something slightly stronger than this. It's replacing this with a one plus R squared. And that's, that's giving this proof. Um, it's actually proving also something way stronger. In the case of the log barrier, this is proving not only does the Hessian not change too much multiplicatively, but it's saying actually uh, the total multiplicative change in all the slacks is bounded in L2. So in other words, if one of these slacks changed by a large constant, then basically none of the other slacks change multiplicatively by too much at all. Um, and this property that the on average change in the slacks over the Hessian ball is bounded, is actually one of the key things that's used in data structures for inverse maintenance, um, used in a lot of the data structures and recent advances that I've talked about. Because it says that whenever you take your point and you move in the Hessian norm, that yes, there might be a big change somewhere in one of your constraints, but on average, most of your constraints are actually stable. This is sort of a notion that changes along um, steps of um, the, um, as you move along the central path, at least for the log barrier, that changes are sort of low rank on average. If one direction things change by a lot, then actually in all the other ones, there wasn't too much change. All right. And again, um, seeing this, you might ask why we're doing everything in such generality. And again, I think it's very useful to know when you're leveraging additional structure of your problem versus you're using a general property of self-concordance. And even when we solve things like max flow, this general self-concordance theory shows up even for more structured problems. All right, why else is this self-concordant property nice? Um, the other reason I think it, this analysis is quite nice is for analyzing things like um, Newton's method. So note that when we took our centering step, we said we took our current point and we took a step by applying the inverse of the Hessian to the gradient. So if we wanna know how much we move in one centering step in the Hessian norm, Note that the change in the Hessian over one step is just the norm of the gradient in the Hessian inverse squared. Um, basically the Hessian and this Hessian inverse cancel. So in other words, when we take one Newton step, if we want to know how much we move in the Hessian norm, like ask whether we're in the Deacon ellipse, this is just about asking whether the gradient is small in the Hessian inverse norm. Um, correspondingly, this, this, this quantity here, the gradient in the Hessian inverse norm is known as the Newton decrement. It's simply how much we move when we take a Newton step. Um, and I'm gonna use this notation to denote the Newton decrement. 
Um, it's also a very just natural notion then for measuring centrality. So it's a question of when you take a Newton step, what is the Deacon, the radius of the Deacon ellipse in which you move? And now we've proven that the Hessian doesn't change too much um, when you don't move by more than a constant in the Hessian norm. So it's natural just to try to maintain the property that this Newton decrement is less than one, is less than some constant. If you do, that'll imply that in every step of Newton's method, you stay within the Deacon ellipse, so you stay feasible. And if it's strictly less than one, you have additional stable properties of the Hessian. So you're taking a Newton step within a region where the Hessian doesn't change too much. Um, and now, whether you think about gradient step or Newton's method, if you take a step in a norm and that norm well approximates your function over the entire region you could have moved in, that typically shows that iterative methods converge very quickly. Like every step will make some large multiplicative progress. And indeed, um, and, and what interestingly in the case of uh, linear programs, what we showed on the previous slide actually says that not only will things like Newton's method converge, but actually most of the slacks won't change too much when we take a single Newton step. All right, so um, this is enough to analyze Newton's method. Um, so you can show for a self-concordant function, you can get a bound on the Newton decrement after a step being um, a certain function of the Newton decrement before the step. And this is a formula that shows that when the Newton decrement is less than one, um, if it's a sufficiently small enough constant, you get some constant times the Newton decrement squared. Um, this gives something known as quadratic convergence. You'll keep doubling the number of bits of accuracy once this is sufficiently small. But for the sake of our purposes, all we need is that this shows that when the Newton decrement is something smaller than, let's say, a quarter, every time you take a Newton step, the Newton decrement halves. All right. um, the proof of this is the same style of proof as before. Look at the line between the two points. Uh, you know, look at how the Hessian changes along the line. Look at the new gradient in terms of the old gradient by integrating along the line. Um, rearrange it so you get a formula of the gradient after the step in terms of Hessians and gradients before, and do some algebraic manipulation and apply self-concordance to bound the total, to, to, to bound what the change looks like. And that gives that plus the stability lemma gives a uh, bound on the new decrement size. Sorry for the, the speed. I want to get to a good punchline to wrap things up for, for today. Um, but I'll post these notes uh, soon after so you can go through the algebra on your own. And and message me if I come if you if I likely had a typo somewhere. Um, um, I should say more broadly, this shows that when the Newton decrement is less than a constant, you can show things like you're not too close, far away from the minimizer in the Hessian norm, and you can also show that your your function error is not too large. So once you're in this regime where you're minimizing a self-concordant function and the Newton decrement is a small constant. You're essentially in a region where Newton steps make a lot of progress towards centrality, and you're not too far from the minimizer. All right, now this gives um, a, a way now of starting to analyze our path following methods, provided that the Newton decrement is not too large. We just prove that you can have the Newton decrement with one step. So now all we need to do is show that when we change uh, mu, the path parameter, the Newton decrement doesn't increase again by too much. If we do this, now we'll now have a scheme for maintaining the property that the Newton decrement is not too large. Right. So all we need to do now is bound, um, sorry, all we need to do now is bound how much the Newton decrement changes when we increase mu. However, um, it's a sort of straightforward lemma. You can show that when you increase the change the path parameter by one plus minus delta, what you'll do is change the value of the Newton decrement by one plus minus delta, plus an additive amount that just depends on the magnitude of delta and the norm of the gradient of the barrier and the Hessian of the barrier inverse. Um, and this just follows by expanding out the gradient and using triangle inequality. Okay. So what this says is if the Newton decrement is small and we increase the path parameter by some one multiplicative plus minus delta, um, the Newton decrement will stay small up to an additive depending on delta and the norm of the gradient and the Hessian inverse. So if somehow 
the gradient of our barrier was never too large in the Hessian inverse norm, we get a fully working method. We could then would have a small Newton decrement, we'd increase the path parameter, we'd still have not uh, a slightly larger Newton decrement, but not too large. We take a new set to decrease it and repeat. So how do we bound the normally gradient of the barrier and the Hessian inverse of the barrier? And the answer to this is we won't. We will just assume that it's bounded, All right? So formally, we'll call a barrier function a self-concordant barrier, or we'll call it a new self-concordant barrier. If it's a self-concordant barrier and it has the property that the gradient of the barrier and the Hessian inverse norm squared is always at most new. We'll just assume that. And that'll be the definition of a self-concordant barrier. Um, now there's a very broad theory for constructing such barriers. We're only gonna, I'm only gonna talk about a few properties we particularly need. Um, you can show that this property also is closed under affine transformation. There's a beautiful result by Nesterov and Nemirovsky that actually says every convex set has a, in D dimensions that's bounded has a D self-concordant barrier known as the universal barrier. This is the result I talked about last lecture. Um, and you can also show that the logarithmic barrier on, our, on the orthant is D self-concordant. So you can show that when you do this affine transformation, you get an N self-concordant barrier, you get an N self-concordant barrier. Um, and this is enough to get a method. Now I'm a bit over on time, um, but I'll, so I'll wrap up, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here for today. Um, so from this analysis that says we can increase D delta, we can change it by one plus minus, basically square root the self-concordance. So this essentially gives a square root self-concordance iteration method. And essentially this says that you can move across the polytope by traversing essentially root um, D uh, Deacon ellipses. So it says you're at a current central path point, the Deacon ellipses inside the polytope, you can optimize over to get the next point. Um, um, and you can do this and every time, um, uh, sorry, you can increase the path parameter by one plus minus square root the self-concordance, keep repeating this procedure. So essentially gives us a way of moving around in the polytope, um, making large multiplicative, constant multiplicative changes by traversing root self-concordance different Deacon ellipses. Um, a bit over on time. So what I'm gonna do uh, next class is continue things here. I'm going to give a bit more of a geometric picture behind self-concordance. So I want to talk a bit more about what self-concordant barriers mean. I want to talk a little bit more about how formally proving that it suffices to advance along the central path to get a sufficiently good optimal point. And once we have this more complete geometric picture of self-concordant barriers, we we'll start talking how to improve on the root n or root number of edges we just proved from the log barrier towards getting better rates. And, and when we have that, I'll touch upon some of the advances for getting even faster run times on Thursday. And that's what we'll do on Thursday. Um, so sorry for running a little over. Um, thank you all for the wonderful questions and I'm happy to stick around for more and I'll put, post the slides up to this point as soon as I can. Uh, thanks. thanks all.